Well, in these weeks following the celebration of the 500th anniversary, the beginning of the Reformation, we're kind of looking at how this theological movement impacted the world around us, the impacts which still persist today. Because the reforms that happened, that's begun under Martin Luther, not only changed the church, it changed society as well as the truths of Scripture came to light under the Reformation. Last week, Vicar Josh, you know, talked about what Christians owed God. And when you think about it, that's kind of a silly question to ask because, I mean, we're talking about God Almighty here, maker of heaven and earth, maker of the universe. I mean, he made everything. So really, what could we, his creation, give him that he couldn't already make for himself? But as was pointed out in the previous two weeks, when it comes to righteousness, being right with God, our standing quorum Deo before God, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that we can add that he hasn't already done for us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Am I right? So God doesn't need anything from us. All that he asks us is sort of what Luther did in the explanation of the first article of the Apostles' Creed. He says what we owe him, and he goes, for all which it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him, this is most certainly true. Today, we're going to look at what we owe our neighbor, or as Luther put it, the Christian quorum mundo before the world. When we think about the Reformation, usually the first thoughts that come to mind are the the gospel that was opened up. And, And that's good. I mean, without the gospel being heart and core and central of our teaching. To make us, uh, make it more likely that we would receive his grace. Our works don't even do the work of accepting his grace. His grace alone, given to us out of love, through the gift of faith, is all sufficient for salvation. What the vicar called the doctrine of justification last week. However, in this temporal world, in our everyday living type, Justification cannot be separated from sanctification, living the faith. A great biblical teaching that was reopened through the Reformation is the teaching of vocation. If God has done everything for our salvation, is there anything that we can do? Before God, no. But before our neighbor, yes. You see, vocation are those areas of service that God has called us. And like I said, since God doesn't need anything from us, our vocation is rightly focused on our neighbor. Most of the time when we in the church talk about the call, We think about pastors and teachers and DCEs and other church workers. But with Luther's teaching about the priesthood of all believers, what we come to understand is that all of us have a call, probably many calls. All of us have a vocation, probably many vocations. I'll use myself as an example here. If I would ask you, what is my call, most of you would say, pastor. And you'd be correct, because that's the way I relate with you most often. But I have other calls in my life. I am called to be a husband. I am called to be a father, a brother, a son. I'm called to be a good neighbor. I'm called to be a good citizen. I'm called to be a member of God's church. These are all callings that I have. These are ways that I serve others by providing, nurturing, caring, supporting, defending, serving, preserving. 
By fulfilling these callings, I'm doing what God has called me to do. And when I serve my neighbor, I am serving God. And here's the kicker that Martin Luther wants to make clear to us. This is how God is working for you in this world. Your parents, your teachers, your employer, your health care professionals, your police officers, these are masks of God working to nurture, provide, defend, and, and, and serve you. So if someone would snidely challenge you by asking, well, what has God done for you lately? You would say, well, let's see. He gave me a wife so that he fed me today. Um, he gave me uh, an auto mechanic to repair my car. He gave me neighbors to protect my property. He's given me farmers and bakers to provide food. Oh, he gave me HVAC folks so that I can stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Uh, he's given me police and deputies and construction workers. Do you want me to go on? Because this is how God works for us in the world. Let's use Abraham as the biblical example. In the Old Testament lesson for today, his, his name was still Abram. He hadn't, his name hadn't been changed to Abraham yet. But in Genesis 12, you, can, you have to appreciate the call that Abraham got here because it turned his life totally upside down. He said, go from your country. I mean, Abram had just moved, uprooted from Ur of the Chaldees and settled in Haran. And now God says, uproot from Haran and go across to a place that I'm going to show you. You know, there was something about Canaan that he wanted to get Abraham to that Canaan area. But then he says, go from there and leave your kindred and your father's house. Family was everything back then. Family was your support group, they were your security, they were your friends, they were your business partners. Family was everything. And yet, God says, Abram, get up and go. Go to the land that I'm going to show you. You know, this was almost like uh, geographic Simon says, right? You know, Abraham, take off and go until I say stop. And so, Abraham had to leave that what he, the people that he knew and the place that he knew to go to a place that wasn't to be yet revealed. That was a crazy call. And we can sort of, re but God said that if you go, I will bless you. Barrenness will become family. Family will become nation. And nation will become an eternal legacy. It could almost be put together like this, a personal mission statement. Follow God, be blessed by God, and then bless others. You know the troubles that Abraham encountered when he got to the land of Canaan, don't you? Lot. Thieving nomads, Sodom and Gomorrah, continued barrenness, no land that he could call his own. It was probably enough for Abraham to say, forget these promises, I'm cutting my losses and going home. But Abraham recalled his call, and that call from God moved him forward. If Abraham hadn't recalled his call, he would have hit a wall. The fact is, though, you might ask yourself, so is this call available to us? Yes, it is. God doesn't make us his own and then say, son, you're on your own. No way. Ephesians 2.10 that we read today, he says there that we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for you to do. God has called you his own in holy baptism and then calls you to live out your baptism by serving your neighbor. 
That is vocation. Now, vocation was a profound, culture-changing doctrine that helped foment the Reformation 500 years ago. The impact of this reform still influences our society today through social mobility and the value placed on work, on all kinds of legitimate work. Vocation may be one of Luther's most original contributions to the understanding of spiritual life because in the doctrine of vocation, spirituality is brought down to earth and transfigures our everyday living and life. Luther chastised his fellow monks and priests and uh, ascetics there and hermits for their lack of vocation. These people were held up on a pedestal for being holy. But Luther asks, how can you be um, serving God when you've walled yourself off from the world? You can't be serving God by, in, in, he said, in reality, you're failing God because you're not serving your fellow human beings. Luther pulls no punches when it comes to the application of God's word. In his commentary on Psalm 82, this is what Luther wrote. He said, I remember here my monks and priests who have the reputation of carrying heaven on their shoulders. Not to insult them, I think they're about as useful to the world as rust on iron. I would rather be a pious secretary or a tax collector for a prince than a useless monk. You see, for Luther... Temporal life, our daily life, is meant to serve humanity. You cannot serve God as a forgiven child of God without being actively engaged in serving your neighbor. What pleases God are not our pious acts of prayer and worship. What pleases God are our pious acts of serving our neighbor as ourselves. Luther criticized any ascent to the heavens that monastic life promised. He insists that God comes down to us as Christ came down to us. Through the good works of everyday life, spirituality is brought down to earth to transfigure our everyday practical life. You catch what that means? Being spiritual, then, is not about how much time you spend in prayer or how you pray. Being spiritual is not about the practices that you do with fasting or maybe singing certain hymns. It's not about memorizing scripture or how often you go to worship, although these things should never be neglected either. It's not about meditating, going on spiritual retreats, or how close you feel to God. For Luther, spirituality is about serving your neighbor, acting in vocation. The mundane ways that you serve other people is how you're acting in the Spirit, how the Spirit moves in you. Such as, Luther would say, simple things as changing the diaper of a child, making a pair of shoes so that a neighbor can buy them for his children. For us, it's as practical as clearing a sewer line if you're a plumber, baling hay for cattle, baking bread, serving as a soldier in the military to maintain peace. Spirituality is found in serving others, acting in your vocation. You can see then how this doctrine of vocation turned the European world upside down and how it still influences our world today. 
No longer is being a monk or a priest or a pastor the only way to really serve God. No longer are religious work considered the highest calling. Everyone has a calling, a vocation. Being a farmer, a truck driver, a police officer, a welder, a grandparent, a student. These are just as important to the world, says Luther, as a priest, even, he says, even a pope. You don't have to be in a religious vocation to serve God. God serves the world through people like you who live out your vocation. God gives each of you unique skills, talents, abilities, inclinations. He also puts each of you in unique set of external circumstances which are to be seen as providentially arranged. You know, vocation is not part of your self-choosing. Remember, <laughs> these are works prepared by God in advance. And so your vocation can be known then through others. Getting offered a job, being elected to an office, finding someone who wants to marry you are all clues to vocation. Vocation is to be found in the place you currently occupy. And no one can say, I don't have a vocation. <laughs> You're the son or daughter of someone. Now, to be sure, none of us ever fills our vocations perfectly. <laughs> there was only one perfect person who carried out his vocation serving others as himself. And when we find ourselves lamenting about how we have failed in our marriage, failed at work, failed as a parent, failed as a son or daughter. We're driven to that one who never fails, that one who has come down to us and walks beside us and comforts us, who forgives us, who heals our failures and heals our hearts, our brother, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus' vocation was that of Messiah, to make the world right again. He began that work by his passion, death, and resurrection. Through his sacrifice, he took our unrighteousness on himself and gave us his righteousness. He has set us free in the gospel and restores to us the joy of salvation. You see, the full restoration of the world is yet to come when Jesus returns in his glory. But even now, we get a glimpse of what is to come through the forgiveness of sins, through the healing of our souls, through the joy of worship. So, what do we owe God? Nothing. When it comes to salvation, he has done it all for us. What do we owe our neighbor? Our good works. Like I've said many times, God doesn't need our good works. But our neighbor does.